Thank you for joining us. I'm Nancy Furness, and this is We've Got Issues. We've Got Issues is a nonpartisan, citizens-based forum where we look at issues of interest to the Tri-Cities. And we are grateful to Tri-Cities Community Television for making these interviews possible. I'd also like to acknowledge that today's interview is taking place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of Coquitlam First Nations. And we're grateful to the Coquitlam First Nation for continuing to live on these lands and care for the lands and waters and all that lies above and below. Today, we're being joined by Jennifer Blatherwick, and Jennifer is running for a second term on um, School District 43 as a school trustee. So thank you so much for joining us today, Jennifer. Thank you, Nancy. I'm glad to be here. I was wondering if, um, for people who don't already know, if you could tell us a little bit about your background and maybe how you came to run uh, for school trustee. Ah, okay. So I have lived in Coquitlam now since mm, 2008, and I'm raising five children here. Wow. And, mm, <laughs> yes, every day is a vacation. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, when I started running for, thinking about running for school trustee, I'd already been serving on um, PACs, and I'd been coaching in schools, and I had been volunteering in classrooms. And one of the things that I saw was how hard everyone in the system was working. Um, my husband's a teacher, and so you get that inside view at home, and then you get it in the classroom as well. And uh, there was an opportunity there, uh, especially when the province was looking at doing a funding model review of how we fund schools in the province. And I okay. thought, okay, if there is a place where I can, where I can make a difference, it would be uh, in advocating to the province for making sure that the funding model that we have in place uh, is best for students. Mm -hmm. and, uh, at the same time, uh, I had also been volunteering for the Citizens Advisory Committee for Corrections Canada. And, uh, sorry, that was a very educational uh, journey for me because it showed me how many of the people who were in the system had been earlier injured by the system or failed by the system. Uh, yes. And uh, you could almost have a checklist of the things that had happened to the people that were there um, who, who made terrible choices uh, and, and had, uh, you know, were, were working through a journey of, of making restitution for those choices. But um, you could almost make a checklist of many of them suffered from learning disabilities. Um, that were undiagnosed earlier in life. Uh, many of them had um, not received care and attention in their early development, mm -hmm. and, uh, and many of them had suffered abuse. And so knowing those things, um, I thought, gosh, I think we're catching these people a little bit far upstream. Right. Right? And so it's time to maybe go try being a little bit farther up the stream mm -hmm. and see if we can keep kids from falling in. I think that's, it's a really interesting point because um, I think you're right, we see the result, but we don't see sort of how, how people quite often came to, um, yeah. to that particular point. And, you know, the education system and having access to resources and, and things like that is so important early on. Yes. Uh, now, now, I don't want to say that things are irretrievable. Because right. uh, being uh, in the Citizens Advisory Committee, one of the things that you learn is that um, British Columbia has one of the lowest, the British Columbia region mm -hmm. has the lowest recidivism rate, uh, the lowest rate of people recommitting crimes in all of Canada. And part of that is that they use actual therapy <laughs> with people who are, um, are inmates. And, and it makes a genuine difference. So I knew if you could take um, actual work and apply it to people who many would consider already far gone. Right. Boy, yeah, some effort, uh, less effort, but way more fruitful effort could be applied to children who were younger and had not yet made some of those choices that made their lives so difficult. Right, and I think a big part of it is kind of um, saving that grief from happening. So yes. I'm, I'm really proud that you said that about <laughs> British Columbia because no. I didn't know that. Yeah, uh, so. for, now that is for federal corrections. Right. I'm not as familiar with the provincial um, correction system because I only volunteered with oh, okay. corrections. So, yeah. 
So can you tell me, now mm -hmm. I'm really interested, you are a school trustee. Yes. I've never interviewed a school trustee oh. before. Okay. And to be honest, I'm not even sure what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Can you tell us a okay. little bit about your job? That's a great question. I actually do. I have a little package presentation that I do for elementary schools, but we'll make it a little bit more interesting than that one. <laughs> or less interesting, actually, because elementary school, school students are a very tough audience. Okay, um, I'll, I'll try not to be too tough. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, school trustees uh, are an elected board, and they are in charge of the corporate running basically of every district and by law we're responsible for balanced budgets and graduation rates oh graduation rates mm -hmm. oh, so okay. so those two things encompass a lot because mm -hmm. graduation rates are affected like we were just talking about by things that happen very very right. far upstream um, often before children ever even enter into the school system. Uh, they are often influenced by factors in their home or their physiological development or th things that will affect whether or not they're going to be able to successfully get all the way to graduation. Right. So uh, that means that, for instance, in SC43, we have Strong Start, which is a program for children who are zero to five. It's free and moms and parents, caregivers can come with their little ones and participate in like a really high quality preschool program, which also provides a free snack. So is that a municipally That's a provincial run? program. Okay. SD43 just happens to be super keen on it. Oh, okay. So okay. Uh, I think because of those reasons mm -hmm. is uh, it gives us an opportunity to connect with parents and with kids and also gives us opportunity to get early intervention. It's really good to build those relationships early and... Enormously. And, yeah. and many parents, um, especially now where lots of families only have one child, right. so they have their, their beautiful child, they leave the hospital, and then no one sees them again right. until they show up Reach for kindergarten. kindergarten. And uh, parents and children are often very happy at home, but they're not in a place, especially over the pandemic. That right. was a big gap where they're seeing um, other parents and other children interact. It can be very isolating. Very Being isolating. a new mom yes. on your own. With, uh, yeah. Enormously. I'm just remembering when I had twins and I was, <laughs> oh. Not isolating for you. Oh. Because you're yeah, I was definitely never alone. <laughs> um, but I would have, I, Strong Start was really valuable to me because okay. having um, twins and at the time I also had three older kids who only one of whom was in school. Uh, and so having a place to go where it was supportive and I could connect with other parents and they were also, bless their hearts, um, they would let you play with glitter and Play-Doh at there and then oh, it meant we didn't have to, you didn't have to come home. home and deal with it for the next 10 exactly. years trying to get that. <laughs> glitter is the worst. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so that also, and, and it, those social emotional development pieces are enormously right. important. Right. Uh, but uh, it also gives us the opportunity to invite in groups like Kinsight um, uh, which is a Fraser Health and Simon Fraser partnership and they do things like assess children for speech and language pathology oh, and sight okay. and hearing and uh, you know and, and mental and physical development and so it gives parents the opportunity to get that information before they get to school. Right so and, there's sort of mm -hmm. you're having interactions with the parents and relationship building there yes. you're having the children coming in and um, you know have the opportunity to see where they are and, mm -hmm. and where maybe they should be yeah, um, and, and then providing resources to help them absolutely get the support that they need should they need it. Those connections mm -hmm. are so important and uh, and though, you know, from the school system's point of view, from the medical system's point of view, they see the same things over and over and over again. Okay. But the journey for every parent is new. Right. And so connecting them to those resources as early as possible mm -hmm. is really important because they have to, parents are, when kids are so little, right, it's parents that guide that learning right. journey, especially in the beginning. They're, they're the most important, they're the first teachers. So. Yeah, it's a joy to be able to connect to parents and um, and see them watch their kid grow. Well, and it really, it, it benefits the whole community too. Absolutely. If you can um, provide that support early on, not yes. only are you helping the parents, because sometimes it can be a little bit overwhelming, wondering, is everything okay, isn't it? Where do I go, like, if things yeah. aren't okay? Uh, so. and, and it's not just um, connecting them with services that, the, say, the school or the system provides. It's mm. also being able to connect them with groups like Family Smart. Right. So Family Smart is like a parent peer-to-peer -peer resource organization. They're a nonprofit. 
and they connect parents together with other parents who've already been a little bit farther down oh, that journey. Okay. So if you have a child who's been recently diagnosed with um, a learning disability or has like cancer or, or another right. challenging illness, they can connect you with another family. It's a bit of support and yeah. you're not alone. And can help you navigate yeah. the complexity of the system yeah. because being in the system, you're very familiar with all the resources right. and where to go and, and how, you know, how all the pieces fit together. But when you're a parent going mm -hmm. through it for the first time, it can be harder. daunting. It's um, very daunting. I went through that recently with my mom mm. going through the healthcare system. She's 102. So oh. trying to access the resources we need and the supports we needed. <laughs> it's and amazing. I, I, my heart goes out to people that don't have yes. that support. I, right? and or, especially people oh. who um, perhaps English is not their home exactly, language. Exactly, yes. Um, that maybe they're a single parent. Um, maybe there's two parents, but they're working, you know, 60 hours a week each. Which uh, is not unheard of. It's not, right? and, and it's becoming more and more common. Um, mm. I will say that for the first time in years, uh, we actually lost a net number of students in the district last year. Oh, okay. So 147 students net lost. Why would be, they're just graduating out or Normally they're replaced, out? graduating students are replaced um, by new kindergarten students. But uh, this time parents and families were letting us know that they're moving out of the Tri-Cities because of affordability issues. Oh, okay. And so yes. we, we definitely lost, uh, we grew as a district, like we gained students mm -hmm. as well, but we lost more students. Net we, loss. Yeah. So do we have enough schools in the Tri-Cities so then if we're actually losing students? We have or enough or schools. Um, we do. I, I would be very happy if we didn't have to have portables everywhere. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> but the great news is I, I think our one of our schools that has the most, the record for the most number of portables is Terry Fox, senior secondary. I think the last time I was there they had 17. Wow. They may have more now actually. Uh, but uh, just on Tuesday, um, the provincial government came to visit us at Smiling Creek Elementary and announced we're going to have a new school, a oh, middle awesome. and secondary school up at Burke Mountain. That's much needed. Isn't it? <laughs> it's a huge relief. Um, I was very happy when we heard that because it's been very hard for the parents who live up on, and the right. families who live up on Burke Mountain to commute their kids down oh, the hill yeah. to the middle and secondary school. Now, so. is that something that as a school trustee, you would be doing lobbying for new schools? Absolutely, okay. that is 100% of, um, I think communicating to the provincial government what we need in our community. So in okay. the same way that like an MLA takes uh, concerns to the provincial body or an MP takes concerns to the federal body, right. we take them to the provincial government. And the, you know they are doing their best to mm. keep up with um, building new schools uh, and also doing seismic replacements, right. uh, which is a very important thing in British Columbia. Uh, but they don't have as um, as good a window into what's happening locally as someone who is coming from your own community. Right, local knowledge mm. is so valuable. Yeah, right? and yeah. and I think for for me, um, one of the things I also participate in is I'm the co-chair for the Tri-Cities Children's Research Action Team, and we are trying to look at ways to improve children's well-being in the Tri-Cities using what's already there in research and forming communities of practice to look at ways that local people can hyper, just hyper local groups can implement um, new programs or initiatives to help what kids. What kind of order. program, like can you give us an example of a, ki a type I, of program? I, now, I'm just gonna warn you that now you've pressed my button. Uh oh <laughs> you pressed my research <laughs> button. So the uh, MDI, the Middle Development Instrument, is conducted, it's a survey, and it's done every year with grades four and grade seven in middle school in every um, district. And we're very lucky that um, the Human Early Learning Partnership at UBC conducts that uh, for us. So it's, right. it's a neutral research-based funded body that um, takes those research results and compares them across districts, um, also compares them longitudinally, so we compare them over time, but breaks it down for us into catchment. So okay. every school catchment has its own, you know, and broken What result. are those parameters? Like, what are you measuring? So they ask the kids things like, do you feel safe? Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, it's, a diff you... it's not an academic. Mm -mm. Oh, okay. So it's, it's all about um, child well-being and vulnerability. Right. So they approach topics like, do you have someone in school do you feel you can go to if there's a problem? Right. Um, do you feel like you have friends? Um, 
how how are you feeling about your family life right mm -hmm. do you feel if you had um you know, like a safety concern is there someone you can go to right and one of the things that we've seen unfortunately over uh the last period of time uh, and this has been exacerbated by the pandemic for sure right is that kids uh tell us that they feel connected to adults at home and they feel connected to adults at school which is great but they don't have someone outside of that that they feel connected to. Oh, interesting. Because okay. of course, you know, like team sports and after right. school activities, before school activities, some of those things have kind of been lost during the pandemic and kids lost that feeling of connection to their wider community. So I think COVID, um, if we can just maybe talk about that just mm. briefly, has had a much deeper impact than maybe we see just, you know, uh, looking. Yeah. How has it affected I, students a, and kids? That's a great question. And, and I will say that um, we see kind of two, two things. Um, and much like everywhere else in, in the world, um, the effect has been disproportionate. So there are students who were successful before and whose parents and families had lots of resources and, are and they're successful, successful now. now. Yeah. yeah. Now, they may have seen some more struggles because there was no kid that was, you know, super happy with the fact right. that they couldn't have playdates. Right. right. But um, many of those kids um, had other resources or their parents could, could compensate. Right. But uh, we saw a lot of the families that were really struggling, um, they had a much harder time in compensating mm -hmm. for some of those losses. And so for, say, the first several months of the pandemic um, when we were first moving in and there was no school for a big chunk of that. Right, that's true. Um, the school district redirected resources from um, from where we would have been putting into classrooms into preparing food hampers and driving them to families. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, we were oh, delivering okay. 400 food hampers a week. Wow. Yeah. And So your yeah. the role is more than education. No, to really. be fair, I was not driving the vehicle. Okay. <laughs> that was that was employees <laughs> that were driving that vehicle. Um, but we were very supportive of it. Yeah, and, mm. and you're right, though. I think your point that um, education is so much more than just so the academics. Yeah. And, and I think anybody knows that already because they remember their favorite teacher. Right, right, right of your, course. Your favorite teacher we was not the one. one who gave you the most high quality worksheet. Um, yeah. Your favorite teacher was the one who, who cared about you. Who struck you. the chord that made yeah. that connection. And saw you yeah. and saw your inspiration. And I think that that's, that's still true. Uh, the role of the school trustee, though, is to not create curriculum, and we don't get into classrooms. Okay, so you're not involved in curriculum No, no that's a provincial body. Okay. And also, uh, within the district, teachers are professionals, and they have professional autonomy. Right. So the province sets curriculum, and teachers teach curriculum. So that is not, they are the professionals in what they do. So right. our job is to set policy. So we would um, create a strategic direction for the district, so determining where funding would go. So one of our initiatives over the pandemic was technology. Um, and we had luckily been reinforcing that over a long period of time before that because it's a real equity issue within our society. Um, we see more and more that we're moving towards digital learning. Right. Um, and. And even when you're doing in-person learning, the kids mm -hmm. are still, you know, writing their essays now well, on technology, the technology is everywhere. Yeah. And and there are many, many students who uh, could not access the classroom completely without digital aids. So I had no idea until my own child um, was diagnosed with uh, dyslexia and dyscalculia um, how deeply important um, mm -hmm. that. Uh, uh, speech to text was going to be for her academic success. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. so, so, so much we don't know until it affects us. Uh, for right? sure, right? And I think that uh, the district had put a lot of work into making sure that every family who couldn't afford a computer could take okay. one home um, so their child could bring one and have one to use in the classroom and have at home. Mm -hmm. But then during the pandemic, um, you know, when we had to have kids learning online for that little while, uh, we had to come up with a significant number of additional really? laptops Interesting. And, and another piece uh, was trying to figure out which families didn't have internet access oh no internet access mm -hmm. even it's so, yeah i guess yeah. it's the i will say tell us um we we went to them and we uh through a very serious intense 
um, you know, things of discussion. Um, they were able to come up with some accounts for the okay. families that were very, very low cost and would allow families who were really not going to be able to afford internet service on their own. That's important. I mean, yes. you know, to get away from technology is yeah. wonderful, but when you're talking about the education system and kids maybe falling behind because yeah. they don't have access to those same resources. Oh, for sure. And our, and our goal in the district is not for kids to use technology to stay away from each other. It's for them right. to connect. Right, right. And um, as, as again, as a parent with a kid with a learning disability um, and another kid who is neurodivergent, it is so important to be able to um, access those resources online right. because it saves everyone so much time. Um, the district uses um, a centralized system where teachers can put assignments online okay. and then you as the parent can go take a look at that assignment. You as the parent can go download it and print it off when your kid is. Oh wow, that's it. even more it's than the best. Yeah, and you can see what the um, the due date is, and you can see what their mark is and what the teacher's comments are. Right, and you can see that in real time. So if you're an engaged parent, you can. There's mm -hmm. a lot of information there for uh, you, and for sure. And as a and as a parent of a student with um, you know who has not always had the best time academically, right, and one of those uh, struggles was her executive function. So it was remembering things and remembering due dates right. and remembering to bring home the printout and, and with the best will in the world and the most effort I have ever seen in a child, uh, still not being able to do it, but being able to just go online and check those things. Right. And so that she wasn't emailing her teacher at 11.59 at night than a day before something Panicking. was Panicking. <laughs> No, right? it's uh, well, yeah. talking about things that I I would never have thought of, and I think probably yeah. others maybe haven't thought of either. So it's uh, well, and school has changed so much mm -hmm. since I went to school. And uh, when I first encountered um, the changes, I was a little skeptical, to be honest. When I took my first one to kindergarten, and they spent the whole first year doing social emotional learning, I thought, where is the ABCs and the one two threes? Right. And they were still there. But they spent uh, an enormous amount of time talking to the kids about how do you feel and how okay. do you talk about your feelings right. and how do you respectfully talk about those feelings with your friend who, you know, may be also having a struggle. Exactly. Or what do you do yeah. when you're angry? How do you even say, how do you identify yeah. that you're angry? Yeah. And uh, I've seen how much of a difference that makes by the time the kids get to later elementary school, middle school, high school. Uh, they have the capacity to talk about their feelings in a wow. way that, as like as a group, I don't think that that say people of my generation. Possess. And definitely not mine. You yeah. you kept that to yourself, and you know, right, you, and you bottled it up. You and, bottled it up. <laughs> uh, and I I genuinely remember um, another parent suggesting that you know two kids go off and settle their differences with a little bout of fisticuffs, right? Mm -hmm. And that is not at all what we recommend anymore. Um, but also that. Uh, you know, kids have the tools mm -hmm. to actually genuinely engage with each other. Before now, it gets to that point right. where they have to go now, off. And... The system is not perfect mm -hmm. um, and, and there are still struggles. Um, I'm sure you're very familiar uh, with the case of um, Amanda Todd. Yes. And her mother, Carol, who just now um, closed, saw the closure of um, the case. Yeah, with the court uh, case. Yeah. And so certainly that particular situation was um, one where digital um, access for children was not helpful. Right, right. And so we spend a lot of time in the district. Carol is actually an educator in our district and she speaks a lot. She brings a lot of digital safety yeah. and respectful digital citizenship mm -hmm. uh, because certainly we know how badly it can go. So, yeah, uh, yeah and we, I mean, it's out there everywhere, right? It so is. it's not like you can say to your child, yep. you're not going, you're not using technology ever. For sure. In the same uh, way that you would never like wait till your kid turns 16 and then hand them the keys to the car and be like, Off best of luck. Yeah. You know, you want to be scaffolding mm -hmm. all of these things all the time. Yes. And, uh, you know, we can talk to them about it at school and we, we do. <laughs> we yeah. talk to them about it a lot. Um, but it's really important that parents also engage their children. Right. Because often people are so reluctant to bring these things up with their kids because they're sure their kids aren't going to listen well, to Well, there's going to be some pushback, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah, but uh, my personal advice is take them for a walk where they can't get away from you <laughs> or get them in a car ride and then just start talking. And, and honestly, asking them. 
their experience. It's true. Yeah. I took my daughter for a cup of tea at a restaurant that was closing soon, and I said, we're not leaving until we settle this. And the restaurant closed down, and she was so horrified. She said, okay, let's right. talk. <laughs> let's, let's. Well, I, I'm not sure, like, the hostage situation, you know, approach is, is always what we want to go for. No. But, but for sure, like, allowing them, they're experts yeah. in, in digital interaction and letting them. Well, they know a lot more probably than yeah. most of us do. And, and what they, if, if I, there would be one thing that I would recommend is that kids won't always want to talk to you about them, but they are very excited <laughs> to talk to you about their friend oh. who messed up. Okay. Yeah. That and, works and, too, I guess. Yeah. And, and starting the conversation by asking, you know, do you know of anyone who, who really, right. you know, had a bad experience with this? Or can you tell me about, you know, what would you do to stay safe online? Or mm -hmm. that they're it, really happy to A way to, to start the conversation, right? Yeah, and kids love to pass advice to their parents. Yeah. And if you're willing to listen, um, sometimes you'd be surprised by what you'll learn. Well, always willing to listen, right? It's, mm -hmm. Yeah, my kids but, taught me about uh, ghost identities the other day. So ghost identities are kids will have more than one social media Oh, um, okay. Identity. So they'll have one that they are like, absolutely, mom, you can be my friend on Instagram. Ah, oh, mm -hmm. okay. And then they have another profile where they... For where my they... friends, but not for you, mom? Yes. So, okay. so my kids were, were discussing that some of their friends have two profiles, but we don't, mom. No, of course not. <laughs> well, that's good to know. Right? <laughs> absolutely. Oh. Absolutely. You know, we've covered so much territory already. Sorry. I, there's another area that I'm hoping that we can talk about a little bit. And, you know, I see you out everywhere in the community at social justice and environmental, um, you know, events and things like that. Do school trustees have a role to play in um, the environment and sustainability and, uh, you yes. know, with respect to bringing schools to net zero. Um, oh, yeah. Can we talk about that a little bit? And I will, there's kind of two pieces. Okay. Um, actually, I would say three pieces of um, environmental sustainability when you talk about districts. And okay. one is at the, the larger operational level. And that is making sure that you have someone, um, not necessarily a trustee, because again, I am not an environmental specialist right? But making right. sure that you have people in the district. Okay. Um, in our district, we have an environmental manager and an energy specialist who go through every single piece of our operations and make sure that we're um, getting every grant, every opportunity, we're getting tunable lights, we're doing the most energy efficient furnaces, you know, we're, everything we can do to reduce right. our greenhouse gas emissions. Now, are they looking at policy or they're looking at... For school trustees, we, we do policy. And but then these environmental... People. Uh, the, yeah. So what they are more looking at is what we've already got in place. Oh, okay. And also making recommendations about policy, though. Okay. If there is a policy that they um, know is could be better right. in terms of environmental policy, then they then they will make recommendations to us, and we can look at changing okay. anything we have in place. And then I would say the second piece is um, honestly student led. So there is an environmental group in every single school, I think, especially in high schools. Okay. And, um, and they are very site specific in what they look at. There is a very passionate group um, at Glen Eagle Senior Secondary. Mm. I don't know if you've met them before, um, but they're very keen and uh, they recently won an award um, for their energy conservation. And then there's the last piece. And if there's anything that I would beg parents for um, is, uh, for their choices um, and what they send with kids for lunch. Because, oh, that's an interesting one. Some mm -hmm. action that we can, people can take as individuals. Yeah. Now, again, we don't need like six people doing everything perfectly. Right. We need lots of people doing, doing their best. A little bit better. And, and I am not demanding perfection from anyone. Right. But litterless lunches mm -hmm. are enormously beneficial to the environment. Okay, when you yes. think about 32,000 kids, and if every single one of them brings a foil wrapper, right, right, uh, that is a lot of foil wrappers. And we can figure out how to reduce the amount of mm -hmm. um, packaging. packaging, the amount of uh, like just containers, the non-reusable containers that children right. bring. Right. And that's very beneficial, not just in terms of environmentalism, but it actually saves the district money that we can then turn around and spend on educators ah. rather than waste management. Excellent. And it so. also um, is good for all the, the children that are involved in sort of a lifestyle, yes. you yes. know, learning uh, how to as, do that. I don't know if, if you have ever been in a workspace where you've tried to be environmentally responsible with your colleagues. 
It's a learning process. It is. And if you can imagine now your colleagues were 18 kindergartners. Um, it's a learning process. It's a learning process. <laughs> but it's important to them. Right. And is it, um, is it going to be environmentally effective in the same way that, you know, making ocean liners electric is well, going to be? every little no? bit. We but it involves them in yeah. making choices. And mm -hmm. um, when we can get kids to care and feel that they have control over yes. um, their contribution to the environment, uh, then it's really enormously useful. And it gives them a sense of power, or you know, not hopelessness, yeah. a sense I, of hope. I agree, uh, because yeah. often um, we approach these topics with kids as if, um, you know, we try and motivate them as if they're adults. Mm -hmm. And adults often need a, you know, a very heavy hand to shift out of their habits. But kids are very sensitive to um, the feeling of like nothing can be done or right. it's, it's this enormous crisis and you need to give them a job. And even if that job is really tiny, if mm -hmm. it's a job that they can do that contributes, they want to be there and they'll do that for you. And they'll do it for the planet. So, and that I think will wrap up there okay. on a really positive note, so that there's something that we can all do. Absolutely. Um, and I, I really appreciate you coming in today, Jennifer. And as I said, this is the first time that I've had the opportunity to speak with a school trustee about some of these issues. So it was a huge learning experience for me as oh, well. Good. And well, really appreciate you taking as the time. a school trustee. I'm very happy that it was a learning experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much, and I hope we can talk again yes, sometime please. in the not-too-distant future. That sounds great. And we'll wish you all the best Thank in your you. campaign coming up. It's October 15th for you October as well? October 15th is the election, yeah, for okay. all municipal candidates and for school trustees okay. as well. So we'll wish you all the best thank in that. You. And thank you so much for joining us. Again, this is We've Got Issues. And we've been speaking with Jennifer Blatherwick, who is um, running for school district 43 uh, school trustee. Thank you.